touch. Um, <laughs> so hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining me tonight to talk about WASPs, uh, what they are and what they do. Um, before we begin, I just want to mention that uh, there will be a Q&A section at the end of the presentation. So uh, you can put in Q&A uh, at any time um, and we will get to them at the end. All right, so uh, as previously stated, uh, and some of this will be repeat information, um, my name is Chris Ellis Kratzer. I am an insect scientist and award-winning author of the book, The Social Wasps of North America, um, which was published last year and established me as one of the youngest field guide authors ever published. Um, I've spent the last five years uh, researching and writing about social wasps, um, which are the ones that build big paper nests um, that many of you are probably very familiar with. Um, in the context of insects, uh, social, um, means that the wasps cooperate to take care of each other's young. This group is almost solely responsible for the bad reputation that wasps have, uh, and includes all of the yellow jackets, hornets, and paper wasps that, statistically speaking, have probably bothered you at some point during your life. This book is the first of its kind and includes over 900 of my own full-color illustrations. Which begs the question, why on earth? Earth, would someone go so far out of their way to write a book about wasps? Ask anyone. Everyone knows that wasps are just the hateful cousins of bees that don't serve any purpose other than making our lives more difficult. Right? Well, that always struck me as odd, and it made me curious. Are wasps the vile creatures that people make them out to be? Or is there more to this story than meets the eye? to give you a, a glimpse into the hidden world outside our daily Let's see. first some background all wasps have three pairs of legs and two pairs of wings their wings fold apart at rest um, but in flight, their hind wings latch onto their forewings um, with a row of teeny tiny little hooks, um, like Velcro, to create uh, a larger flexible wing, um, which serves as a single aerodynamic surface and makes them very quick and agile flyers. Wasps all have mandibles on the sides of their mouths. Um, they also have little claws at the end of their feet. Some wasps even have little paw pads that they can use to walk on walls like geckos. Most wasps also have a thin waist in the middle of their body, um, which acts like a hinge to make their bodies more flexible. There are hundreds of thousands of different species of wasps. They are incredibly diverse. Wasps come in almost any color and shape that you can imagine, and they all have different roles to fill in nature. For example, sawflies are simple plant eaters with babies that are easily mistaken for the caterpillars of moths and butterflies. Spider wasps hunt spiders to feed their babies. Jewel wasps uh, act like little pirates. Uh, they raid the nests of other wasps for food. Gall wasps sting plants and trick them into building protective little houses for their babies. Some wasps make nests out of mud and others make nests out of paper. Some wasp babies are parasites within other bugs. Wasps ties only one or two other types of insects, typically. Just every other insect has a the surface in New Jersey. So wasps are a huge group. Even bees and ants, often depicted as unrelated in, are both just specialized types of wasps. But I don't say that to alarm you. Though we are surrounded in our daily lives, most wasps cannot sting. Stinging wasps have an organ uh, near their butt, which is called the stinger. Only female wasps can sting. The males, though almost identical to the females in appearance and number, simply can't. They don't have a stinger. The ability to sting evolved only once. 
all of the stinging wasps today are descended from that one common ancestor. The ability to sting evolved a long time after the first, which is part of the reason there are so many of them that don't. And just NBs quits that ability. It's kind of like how whales are technically mammals, even though they don't look or act very much like the rest of the group. So out of all of the wasps that we discussed earlier, only a handful of these groups can actually sting. But many of the ones that can sting can really pack a punch. So let's talk about them. There are a few really important things to remember in order to reduce your risk of getting stung. I haven't been stung a single time since I started studying wasps up close years ago, so I know these tips work. Still, wasps are wild animals, uh, and these tips are not magic, so interact with wasps at your own risk. If you find yourself next to a wasp nest, stay calm, breathe slowly, and move slowly. Wasps are attuned to sense rapid movements and carbon dioxide. So if you minimize these, you minimize your risk. Again, stay calm, breathe slowly, and move slowly. If you disturb a nest, or if you are stung near a nest, stay calm, move quickly away from the nest, and alert others. Try to avoid flailing your arms. Erratic movements will increase the likelihood that you are stung. Make sure to alert other people in the area of the danger so no one else is hurt. Again, stay calm, move quickly, and alert others. Wasps usually only try to sting people uh, when defending their nests or if they are physically harassed, such as being squeezed or swatted. Foraging wasps are rarely aggressive. A single wasp typically won't try to hurt on purpose. To avoid accidental stings, you should wear closed-toed shoes when outdoors. Now, unfortunately, wasps don't understand things like outdoor picnics and markets. They smell the food and fly in to eat it and then get frightened by the big animals, humans, trying to hurt them. The best way to prevent wasps from panicking is to avoid attracting them to begin with. Many species of social wasps are attracted to meat, rotting fruits, and sugary fluids, such as sauces, juices, and soft drinks. When outdoors, make sure to properly cover food and drinks and dispose of waste in an appropriate covered bin or container so the wasps won't be able to smell it from as far away. Now, because it is my area of study, let's take a look at j how just social wasps fit into the food web. For our purposes, at the bottom of the food chain, we have crops and native plants which are eaten by bugs that we usually think of as pests, like grasshoppers, beetles, caters, and flies. Social wasps, because they are not, not pea eaters, they hunt all of these different plant pests and, in doing so, help to protect the plants that we rely on. They are especially good predators of harmful caterpillars. Social wasps, in turn, are hunted by a wide variety of larger animals. They are an important food source for many songbirds and lizards. Perhaps more surprisingly, however, is their importance to mammals that hibernate. Baby wasps, which are protected within a wasp nest, are a vital food source for bears, skunks, raccoons, opossums, and coyotes, especially in the fall. These mammals eagerly brave hundreds of angry wasps to feast on their young in order to store up on fat and protein for the long winter ahead. Large mammals are a big threat to wasp nests, so social wasps have evolved defensive behaviors that specifically target large mammals. Unfortunately, we are large mammals, so that's why they cause us so many problems. They evolved to defend their young from predators that to them, look just like us. So to recap, let's look at an example of how wasps affect the broader ecosystem. When wasp populations plummet, pest populations surge. Too many pests can stress or kill their host plants, 
which isn't good for anybody. Conversely, when wasp populations are healthy, pest, pest populations are kept in check, and the plants that they feed on are able to thrive. Because of the sheer number of insects that wasps catch and eat, wasps and ants are the most important in tats on now all of this is not to say that caterpillar of course um, for the environments in moderation and that wasps are critical for maintaining that balance now let's talk about pollination. Again, because it is my area of study, let's focus in on just the social species. Social wasps are them important pollinators. The fuzzier wasps tend to be more efficient pollinators than the smoother ones because pollen sticks to them better, um, but they are all essential. Many native flowers in North America evolved specifically for social wasp pollination, uh, including asters, goldenrods, many cacti, mints, jewelweed, and milkweed. In temperate regions, many of those plants time the emergence of their flowers with the peak of wasp colony developments in the fall, although some of them also coordinate their flowering with the emergence of new queens in the spring. In North America, Social wasps are also important pollinators of numerous food crops, such as carrots, parsnips, celery, and sunflowers, as well as many spices, such as oregano, basil, peppermints, spearmints, lavender, fennel, dill, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. All right, now time permitting, and I think we have plenty, um, I would like to walk you through the top 10 most common social wasps in New Jersey to give you some familiarity with the wasps in our area. If these illustrations look familiar, uh, it's because I have shamelessly stolen them from my book. So without further ado, let's dive on in. Number 10 is the common aerial yellow jacket, so named because it typically constructs paper nests high in tree branches. It is common in forest habitat throughout the US and Canada. Number nine is the German yellow jacket, an invasive species from Europe. It was accidentally introduced to Montreal in the 1960s, um, probably via a nest in a shipping container. Um, and its range has expanded substantially since then, uh, especially over the last 20 years. The German yellow jacket is now found on every continent except for Antarctica. Number eight is the red coat paper wasp. Paper wasps construct relatively small umbrella-shaped nests uh, in semi-sheltered locations, um, also made of paper. Number seven is the coral paper wasp, so-called because its color pattern superficially resembles that of a coral snake with red touching yellow. The range of the species is expanding northwards uh, due to climate change. Um, it was only, it was once only found, excuse me, <laughs> let me try again. It was once only found as far north as South Jersey, but can now be found throughout the state. Number six is the Southern Yellow Jackets. Most yellow jacket nests are annual, which means they only last one year. However, nests south of Tennessee can become perennial when they are used year round by the same family of wasps. The largest perennial yellow jacket nest ever recorded belongs to the species and measured a staggering nine feet tall. It should be noted that a nest that large is exceedingly rare and annual yellow jacket nests rarely get larger than a pumpkin. Number five is the European paper wasp, another invasive species from Europe. It was accidentally introduced to Massachusetts in the 1970s and has since become a major pest species and one of the most abundant wasps on the continent. Number four is the Eastern Yellow Jackets, 
Like many yellow jackets, the species builds paper nests in old rodent burrows. Number three is the European hornet, which is one of the largest wasps on the continent. It is, you guessed it, yet another invasive species from Europe. It was accidentally introduced to New York in the 1850s uh, and is now well established across most of the eastern US. This species is often attracted to porch lights at night. Number two is the imposter paper wasp, so called because it mimics so many other species of wasps. This is one of its color forms, but for how varied species is, here are many more. Remember, this is all one species. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the number one most common species of social wasp in New Jersey, the bald-faced hornet. These wasps are called hornets because of their large size, but they are technically yellow jackets. Like the common aerial yellow jackets, this species builds large paper nests uh, pretty high up in trees. The nests are easiest to spot in winter, but the wasps are long gone by then. Only the queens hibernate through the winter in rotten logs or loose soil. The rest of the colony dies in the fall. And this is true of all social wasps in New Jersey. All right, <laughs> so we got that, that pretty fast, um, which means we have lots of time to, for questions. Uh, but before we move on to q and I wanted to briefly mention that I am hard at work uh, on a field guide to cicadas. So even if wasps aren't your thing, um, we here at Owlfly have lots more in store for you in the near future. All right, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about a very under appreciated talk. Uh, we now have time for some. Let's get started on questions. Uh, Juanita, how do, how would you like to cover this? Well, um, um... would you like me to just. Yeah, if, if you're comfortable just opening up the Q&A yourself and answering those questions, that'll be fine. I can keep an eye on the chat just in case somebody does manage to get something in there. <laughs> I'll also put in the, uh, I'll put in the uh, links that I talked about earlier at the same time. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. I can definitely do that. Uh, okay, we have starting off a question from Ava. Um, in what ways are digitizing WASP collections increasing global knowledge of WASPs over the last few years? Any experiences with these collections and their impacts on your work? Um, absolutely. Um, the digitization of WASP collections, which is the process of taking pictures of old museum specimens and recording all the data that's associated with them on database online. Um, that has been tremendously beneficial to WASP scientists like me um, because it opens up so much more data for us to access and use. Um, I used a lot of museum collection data um, in writing my books. Um, and uh, it has really opened up a lot of possibilities, especially for people who are traditionally excluded from these sorts of spaces. So yeah, it's been tremendously beneficial. There's a question for uh, Dan here. Uh, is your book available in paper? Um, it is indeed. <laughs> so here's a copy of my book. Um, if you go to uh, the QR code that's on the screen right now or to www.owlflyllc.com, that's O-W-L-F-L-Y-L-L-C.com, you'll be able to pick up a copy for just $25. So thank you for the question. <laughs> gorgeous book too. I have a copy. I love it. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, a question for uh, from Jenny. Uh, what do the M and X uh, stand for in these figures? So that's a great question. So what uh, she's referring to is the, uh, there's little M and X on a lot of these illustrations um, at the bottom there, um, because each of these uh, illustrations is split down the middle to show the extremes of different color forms. Um, I thought that'd be an, a, an easier way for uh, folks to be able to identify different species. So in this case, the M stands for melanic or more black, 
and the X stands for xanthic or more yellow. Um, there are other symbols used throughout the books to refer to other uh, color variations. Um, some of them have an F um, for ferruginous, which is more red or brown. Um, there's at least one that uses cyanic, which is more blue. Um, so it's just like a scientific notation. Um, Was I muted? How long was I muted? Hello? I just accidentally unmuted you while unmuting myself, but there is a little bit of a, um, you're, you're kind of um, freezing up a little bit every so often. I'm not sure whether that's at your end or at, at this end. I don't know, it said internet connection is unstable or something, but. Oh dear. Okay. Well, there's. But, but anyway, uh, but but that was per again. That was just my fault. I just accidentally hit the right, hit the wrong uh, button. But you're okay now. Okay, great. <laughs> That's a relief. Sorry for the interruption. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, Eric Eaton uh, asks to please explain Xanthic versus Melanic. Uh, hopefully, I've done that. If not, uh, you can ask another question below. Um, he also asks, uh, how are workers different from queens, um, which is a fantastic question. Um, in the case of wasps, um, there are typically three different castes, which work kind of like uh, human sexes. Um, so there's uh, queens, workers, and males. So the queens are the main reproductive caste. Um, they are the ones that hibernate through the winter, the only ones that survive winter uh, in this climate. Um, and they start off a comp call, excuse me, they start off the colony in the spring. So they start building the nest uh, and then they start laying eggs uh, from which workers emerge and continue to help building the nests. Um, workers uh, cannot produce more workers. So that's sort of the queen's job at that point. And then the workers just help collect food and build up the nest. Um, and then males and new queens emerge in the fall to mate and reproduce. Um, a question from Bing Yang. Uh, why do I see the the bald faced hornet eating wood? Um, that is a great question. So, uh, if you've ever seen a wasp like uh, seemingly eating wood, um, like a strip of wood off of a tree or off of an old plank of wood, um, what they're doing is not actually eating it. They are gathering it up into a little ball. Um, which they will fly back to, the, to their nest um, and then mix with their saliva, excuse me, um, to create a sort of pulp um, from which they're able to actually create paper. Um, so once they have that uh, collected pulp in their mouth, uh, in their mandibles, um, they're able to uh, sort of squish it into shape um, when they get back to their nest. Um, and every time they fly off and get some pulp and bring it back, they're able to add one more little layer to the nest. Um, and they sort of just build up the nest that way, um, kind of like tiny 3D printers. It's it's super cool to watch. Um, so great question. Um, question from C. Um, with global warming, will the wasps continue to die off in the winter? Um, great question. Um, some of them probably will. Um, because it is evolutionarily ingrained within them. Um, but the concern that I would have is that the species that create perennial nests um, will continue to move further north. So homeowners may experience more difficulties with larger nests um, as the climate warms. Um, we'll also expect to see more uh, Southern species make their way up north as well. So, yep. Um, question from Brittany. Um, your illustrations are great, and thanks for the talk. Uh, when you showed the top common wasps in New Jersey, what were the two to three different types you showed per species? Um, I recognize the MF symbols, but what was the third one? The third one was the workers. Yeah. So good question. I apologize for not making that clear. Uh, another question about Melanic and Xanthic, um, but I believe that has been answered. Um, thank you, Nicole. Um, question from Hannah. What's this yellow jacket that burrows in the ground? So there, uh, that's actually a little bit of a complicated question. Um, so there are a lot of different types of yellow jackets that create paper nests underground. But the thing is they don't 
dig the burrows themselves. Um, wasps are very smart, which means they can be very lazy like us. Um, so if they find a cavity that already exists, like from a old gopher burrow, for example, um, they will readily use that instead. So they, they love uh, to make use of existing structures rather than doing the work themselves. Um, I believe there are, uh, I want to say a dozen uh, species of um, yellow jackets that uh, burrow in the ground in North America. Um, and they all look pretty similar. <laughs> you can tell the difference between uh, each of these different species. A uh, question from Robin. Uh, is there some way to easily distinguish which are the beneficial flies? No, <laughs> there is not. There are, um, like I said, hundreds of thousands of different species of wasps. There's also hundreds of thousands of different species of flies, um, and they all have different niches within the ecosystem, which means some of them are pestiferous, some of them are pests, um, and a lot of them are beneficial. And the only way to know which is which is by studying them. Um, so if you'd like to become an entomologist, uh, please do. It's a great time. Uh, but it's, unfortunately, there's not a simple answer. Oh, <laughs> Robin added a clarification afterwards. I mean wasps. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, the same is true for wasps. Um, there's no easy way to tell the beneficial species from the pestiferous ones. And the reason it's so complicated is that a lot of the ones that can be pests can also be super beneficial. And it just depends on like what industry you're in. Um, like uh, if you are a farmer, um, you're much more likely to have a good relationship to wasps than if you run an orchard, because in orchards, wasps will eat a bunch of rotten fruit and then get drunk and then fly around and sting people. But in uh, agriculture, other agricultural areas like um, typical field farming, um, wasps serve as pollinators and pest control and don't typically make their nests like right there in the field. Um, so. It depends. And the answer is also, there's no way to tell easily without studying this. Um, uh, David asks, are some bees wasps also? Um, so the question is, yes, all wasps are, or sorry, all bees are wasps. Um, bees are a specialized type of wasp um, that evolved to have uh, something, a structure called a pollen basket on their hind legs, um, which they can use to gather pollen more efficiently. Um, so uh, all bees are wasps, but not all wasps are bees, if that makes sense. Uh, Charlotte asks uh, uh, another question about uh, melan melanthic, xanthic, uh, ferruginous, and leucistic. Um, Again, if I have not made that clear, please ask this question again. Um, why the difference in coloration beyond sex? So that's actually a really fascinating question. And the the simple answer is we don't fully know at this time. Um, entomology is still a very, very understudied field of science. Um, and there's a lot. We just have no idea why things are the way they are. Um, there are a few different things that we know uh, affects coloration in wasps. Um, temperature can affect certain species. Um, there is some genetic components, of course. Um, there is also uh, diet can play a role. Um, I might not be able to remember all of these off the top of my head, but there's a lot of different factors, some of them environmental and some of them genetic that affect a wasp's coloration. Oscar asks, uh, what's the safest method of relocating a hive of wasps? My house seems to be a favorite place to make a home for whatever reason. <sighs> That's a tricky question. So I will preface this by saying that I am not a wasp removal expert. I am an entomologist. So I study them. Um, I'm not super trained in getting rid of them. Um, but from my experience, and again, ask a professional, um, the best way of, of relocating a hive of wasps is to uh, catch them early in the spring. So early in the spring, the nests are going to be very small. 
um, and it's going to be much easier to relocate um, because uh, how aggressive a wasp colony is depends largely on how large it is. Um, if, a colon if a wasp colony is very small, um, the wasps will sooner flee than uh, attack. And if the wasp nest is very large, the wasp will sooner attack than flee. Um, it's sort of like, if you can imagine, like, the defenses around a human village versus a human city. Um, one of them has a lot more to lose, so they're much more likely to stick around and defend it. Um, so yeah, my, my advice is to try to spot the nests before they become a problem um, and watch for, for wasps going back and forth consistently to a specific location. Um, uh, and if you have any further questions, I fully recommend uh, getting in touch with your local pest control services. <laughs> Uh, Fen asks, uh, is there a way to distinguish imposter paper wasps in the field? Um, so it depends on where you find them and what the specific color pattern is. Um, there are a lot more wasps than I covered just now in the presentation in New Jersey, um, and certainly in the continent. Um, so uh, the, the, the black uh, imposter wasps with um, white stripes are the easiest to ID probably. Um, but once you get into some of the more complex patterns, um, there's a lot of other wasps that look like them. Um, so it really depends on the color, um, how easy they are to distinguish. Um, they always have uh, certain very subtle morphological features um, that can you can tell them apart from other species, but you really have to be trained in the field to be able to do that um, consistently and accurately. Um, the, the thing with wasps and the reason that so many of them mimic each other is because if um, if a predator eats one wasp um, and has a bad experience because they just ate a wasp, they will remember that color pattern um, and remember not to try to eat it again. Um, so it benefits wasps evolutionarily if they all share the same color patterns. Um, and so what ends up happening is these different uh, what we call mimicry complexes arise in different geographic locations. So like in the Northeast, the most common uh, mimicry pattern is a uh, black base um, with uh, some red splotching over top. Um, but in the Southeast, or sorry, in the Southwest, um, the most common is uh, a red base with uh, heavy yellow markings. Um, which I just find fascinating from an evolutionary perspective. Um, so yeah, great question. Uh, Charlotte asks, do social unparasitic symbi symbiotic relationships with other animals? That is a good question. Um, the answer is yes. So there are um, most social wasps um, engage in a form of agriculture, <laughs> which a lot of people are very surprised about. Um, humans are not the only animals who have mastered agriculture. Um, so uh, what a lot of wasps will do is they will um, find a wild herd of plant hoppers or leaf hoppers or tree hoppers or any of the little bugs that feed on tree sap. Um, and they will uh, milk them for uh, what a uh, substance called honeydew, which is like the bug equivalent of milk, um, <clears throat> and then use that to feed themselves in their colony. Um, but in return, they will uh, sort of shepherd, sort of push the, the bugs around to different parts of the plant so they don't stress out the plant too much. Um, and they also um, will protect their herds um, from other predators, um, uh, which is crazy. <laughs> and uh, if you look carefully, I'm certain that you'll be able to find some of this happening in your own garden this coming summer. Um, it's it's really cool to see. Um, Dan says, um, I only saw uh, the book on Kindle on Amazon. Um, I promise you it is in other formats and other places in the internet. Um, I recommend trying out that QR code. Um, I'm sure that'll bring you right to the right spot uh, if you're looking for the soft cover. <clears throat> Devon asks, uh, where would you recommend someone look for a career studying wasps professionally? Um, 
that is an excellent question. So uh, for me personally, I took a really weird uh, route into this field. I started out in engineering um, and sort of veered off into bugs somehow. Um, uh, I don't recommend that route per se. Um, a lot of my colleagues and peers have gotten into the field through uh, specialized entomological studies at universities. Typically you need a, um, to get a, a permanent job in this field, you usually need a master's um, in entomology. Um, but some people also get into this field by starting out uh, volunteering at museum collections or at um, uh, wildlife centers, um, and then get hired on full time to do conservation work or uh, museum dig digitization, um, as was previously mentioned, um, or uh, any number of other taxonomic studies uh, that involve uh, museums and curation. Um, so, uh, and then there's also a couple people I know who have gotten into this field from pest control. So starting there and then sort of working their way over to more of the educational side of things. So there's a lot of roots into this field, but it is not an easy field to make a lot of money in. So just full disclosure. Full disclosure. Uh, Dan says, I will buy it. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Being Young says, uh, also, I have a question about wasp anatomy. Uh, anatomy. Uh, the thin bit between the butt in the middle, how is it so thin? How does it exchange nutrients at a choke point? Um, I come from a mammalian perspective, so I am definitely out of my depth. Um, that is a fantastic question. Um, wasp anatomy is bonkers. Um, so let me just go back to that uh, slide that I had before so I can show it off what we're talking about. Come on. It's right at the middle. There we are. OK. Um, so what they're talking about is that little uh, pinch points uh, between the uh, the gaster and the mesosoma, um, which is the wasp equivalent of a thorax. Um, so the reason it evolved this way was because the ancestor of all stinging wasps was a parasitoid. It was parasitic, uh, and it needed to be able to angle its abdomen down in order to see and sting and inject its eggs into its prey so that its larvae could develop inside of it. Um, there are three main tubes that go through that section of the abdomen. Um, there is the circulatory system um, tube, which is like the heart and stuff. Um, that, that has an artery that goes through there. There's also the uh, part of the trachea, so part of the digestive system um, moves through there. And then uh, finally, the nervous system, uh, the main cord that runs from the uh, front to the back of the insect runs through that pinch point. Um, and they are able to do this because of their size, um, because they are able to have a lot more structural stability there. Um, per unit volume. Um, uh, so it's crazy from our perspective, um, being large and having physics work slightly different from us at this scale, um, but it works for them for the most part. Um, the one strange thing is the adult uh, wasps cannot eat solid food because if they tried to, it would get stuck <laughs> before that pinch point. Um, so what they do is when they go out and hunt insects, they bring that food back to their larvae, which don't have that pinch point, and then the larvae is able to eat it. Um, and then the wasps, the, the adults, uh, typically rely on nectar and sap and honeydew in order to survive. But yeah, great question. Charlotte asks, uh, how does the behavior of the social behavior of wasps differ from uh, the more familiar social bees? Um, great question. Um, so wasps are a lot more competitive, um, especially in the wasps that don't have a rigid caste system. So that rigid caste system that I described before, the queens, workers, and males, um, in some species that's rigid and that's determined from birth, and in other species, they're a little bit more fluid between worker and queen. Um, so there's a lot more competition 
um, to see who can be the dominant egg layer in the co colony. Um, bees are typically a little bit more relaxed <laughs> about this. Not completely, they can still be cut through, but like um, there's a lot less like, I would say drama <laughs> in bees <laughs> than there can be in wasps, um, in, in social wasps specifically. Um, Monica asks, uh, do different species of wasps have preferences to certain native plants? Yes, absolutely. Um, there are a lot of species of wasps that are host specific to a specific uh, type of plant. Um, and I have less experience with that part of it because uh, like I said before, I study primarily the social species um, and they tend to be more generalists, but there are a lot of um, other types of wasps that have only one or two other plants that they feed on, um, which is great for those plants because then they have dedicated pollinators. <clears throat> Excuse me. Need a drink and I'll get back to questions in just a second. All right. Hannah asks, uh, what is the yellow jacket that nests in holes in the ground? I uh, already answered this. There's a lot of them. <laughs> if you want to know specifics, uh, you can feel free to check out my book. Um, it's all detailed in there. Um, Sarah asks, uh, I've noticed the wasps in my area get more aggressive in the fall, mostly the yellow ones. Um, is this a response to the looming winter um, or something about the brood uh, is getting older, stress, end of life? Great question. Uh, so uh, the reason that this happens is because of that relationship between the size of the colony and the aggressiveness of the colony. Um, since uh, wasp colonies start out in the spring, um, basically from scratch, um, they get bigger and bigger and bigger until they reach their maximum in September, October. Um, and that's when they're at their biggest and most aggressive. So it's a function of colony size. Um, and then right after that, of course, most of the colony dies. <laughs> Um, I'm pretty sure it's not caused by stress. Um, I don't think they're aware of what's happening, which is tragic, but also probably for the best. Um, Jenny asks, um, I noticed some of the wasps had an intersex symbol next to them instead of male or female. Is this common? Um, so in this case, I'm using intersex to refer to, um, well, it's not technically an intersex symbol. It's the uh, androgynous symbol. Um, because uh, there isn't a symbol for workers, so I had to figure out what fit them best. Um, wasp casts are weird and do not have uh, like human counterparts necessarily. Um, so I did the best with what I had. <laughs> um, but yes, it's common. Uh, most species have a worker class uh, cast, um, uh, at least among social species. Um, Fen asks, uh, how can people outside academia um, explore digital collections for reference? Great question. So um, there are a few different uh, digital collections that I love to reference myself. Um, there is the uh, British Museum of Natural History has a lot of their collection dig dig digitized and photographed. Um, so that's a great place to look. Um, the American uh, Museum of Natural History also has a huge uh, uh, online database. Um, the Smithsonian is starting to, um, but I don't think they're really there yet, at least with their insect collections. Um, I can, I'm trying to think if there's other big ones that I've used a lot of. If you're curious about a specific group, um, I recommend getting in contact with uh, or just searching online to see if there are any insect collections in your area. Um, there's often ones in universities and museums. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and uh, you are always able to uh, reach out to the curators of these uh, collections. Uh, just send an email their way and say like, hey, um, I'm interested in visiting this collection. Um, usually they will say yes. So. Um, at least as long as you have a specific goal in mind. Um, like, I want to study this species. I want to see these specimens. Um, they're always looking for volunteers as well. So uh, if that's up your alley, uh, that's the thing that you can do. Um, 
also highly recommend iNaturalist if you haven't already uh, checked it out. Um, iNaturalist is great for referencing um, not necessarily museum collections, but certainly a lot of natural history data, and I use it all the time. Um, Nicole asks, uh, do wasps have agricultural value? Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, like I kind of alluded to before, <clears throat> there are different industries that feel differently about wasps, uh, like orchards don't love them all the time. Um, a lot of different agricultural fields um, uh, appreciate having wasps around because they are great for pest control. So you don't have to use as much pesticides if you have a healthy population of, excuse me, of social wasps uh, in your area. Um, let me just reference this real quick to make sure that I'm not forgetting anything. Um, there are, and then also to a, a, a limited extent for agricultural pollination, well, social loss can be very, very useful. <clears throat> um, these questions are coming in very fast. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, May asks, uh, roughly how long did you have to look at specimens while researching your book? <clears throat> that is a fascinating question. Um, it took me uh, over a thousand hours of poring over wasps. Um, I have a lot of focus <laughs> and I figured I might as well use it for something. Um, so yeah, I, I spent thousands of hours um, maybe not thousands, but th uh, over a thousand hours uh, looking at wasps in order to write this book. Um, Oscar asks, what is the most interesting social wasp species to research to you? Um, you're asking me to choose between <laughs> 280. Um, so, so whenever someone asks me if I have a favorite wasp, I just change the answer every time. I think today I'm feeling, mm, maybe uh, moon wasps, uh, which are a, a species in the Neotropics, so Central America and South America, or, or not a species, rather, a genus um, uh, uh, is what moon wasps are. Uh, so they're called moon wasps because they are exclusively nocturnal. Um, they have huge eyes, um, and they uh, sort of all congregate on the bottom of their nest. Their nest is sort of like, uh, it looks like a lotus seed pod, if you've ever seen one of those. Um, so it's like really thick at the base. Um, and when it, when it's daytime, they all just sort of sleep um, gathered around like in in formation underneath the, the nest. And they look like candy corn to me because <laughs> they're all like yellow and reds. Um, and I just think that's neat. <laughs> um, Uh, Ava asked, uh, do hives of social wasps make group decisions colonies? Yes, yes, they do. They communicate primarily through pheromones, um, though they can also do it through uh, their vision is pretty good at small scales, um, so they can see what each other are doing and communicate that way. Um, they, uh, uh, a lot of uh, tropical species will swarm um, in order to determine uh, where to uh, build their next colony kind of in the same way that uh, bees will do. Um, so yes, they, they do make group decisions similar to ants and bees. Uh, Dan uh, writes, uh, I read that the material is called card. Am I remembering that correctly? Um, I'm sure that somebody uh, calls it that. Uh, that's not what uh, I typically call it. Um, I call it... Uh, just typically paper. <laughs> it's just the easiest way to get that uh, information across. Um, some species will use other materials, of course, so some of them will make it out of carton, um, which is sort of a mixture of wood pulp and mud and sand, um, which is a little bit more durable, um, typically, than traditional paper uh, that wasps will use. Um, and then, of course, if you go beyond the social species, there are some that make it exclusively out of mud, or exclusively out of like chewed up leaves or other materials. So um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Um, Sarah writes, uh, not a question, 
but I have noticed European wasps eating spotted lanternflies. Yes, they they do do that. Um, the European paper wasp, or sorry, the European hornets. Actually, I'm not sure if you're referencing European paper wasps or European hornets in this case, but um, in any case, they both eat them. Um, the uh, their their native ranges actually uh, both range into Asia, um, so their range overlaps with where spotted lantern flies are originally from. So they are invasive here, and they do cause a lot of ecological damage. But they also are good at eating spotted lantern flies sometimes. So nature is complicated. <laughs> uh, Ollie asks favorite wasp fact. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Hmm. I'll have to think about that one. There's a lot of wasp facts that are very good. <laughs> um, so, uh, C asks, are any nests reused? Um, no. Once a wasp colony has stopped using a nest, uh, they will not use it again. Um, so uh, if a nest is empty, it will stay empty. <laughs> Jackie asks, uh, can you provide a summary or overview of wasp mimicry, visual, chemical, how it affects us, et cetera, et cetera? I could, or you could buy my book, and there's a whole chapter in there about it. Um, so I can at least show you that uh, some of examples of um, other insects that mimic wasps, because um, there are a lot of them. Uh, let's see. So here's here's a page that shows a lot of the different species that mimic wasps. Um, the the names in green, uh, I believe, are Batesian mimics, and the ones in orange are mal malarian mimics, um, which just means uh, Batesian mimicry is like uh, when a non-hazardous species mimics a hazardous one. Um, so like if a moth uh, mimics a wasp, um, and malarian mimicry is like what wasps do, uh, where they all mimic each other, it's when a hazardous species mimics another hazardous species, just to share in the mimicry. <clears throat> Um, I think the the moths that mimic wasps are, are the most absurd just because of how well they mimic them. Like, that's a moth, that's a wasp, and that's a fly. And these two are harmless. And this one's a wasp. It's like, evolution is crazy. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Jenny asks, is there a difference between wasps and hornets? Uh, yes. Uh, so hornets are a specific type of wasp. Um, they're, uh, so in the same way that all bees are wasps, not all wasps are bees. All hornets are wasps, not all wasps are hornets. Um, so it's a specific type, one genus. Uh, Ava asks, will you ever release a second edition hardcover of your field guide with a yellow cover jacket? That is very tempting. Um, there is going to be a second edition coming out of my book in 2025. <clears throat> I got a book deal with Princeton Press to do it. Um, I probably won't do this, but it is very tempting. Um, I have... Uh, actually, I'm not going to get into that right now. The short story is, um, with my engineering background, I am also working on uh, developing better insulation for houses based on wasp nests, which we are calling yellow jacket. But that's a whole different thing, which I'm not going to go into in detail right now. Uh, Nicole asks, uh, what sort of conservation efforts can I do to help preserve wasps in my area? Fantastic question, and thank you so much for asking. Um, so. Uh, the things that can preserve wasp species are the same things can, that can preserve all insect species. So things like habitat restoration, um, planting native uh, plants in your garden, um, making investments in sustainability to prevent the worst effects of climate change. Um, all of those, excuse me, all of those things are good. Um, for specifically wasps, um, probably the 
easiest thing that you can do is just plant a bunch of goldenrod. They love the stuff, um, and uh, so do a lot of insects in our area. Um, so, yeah. Thank you for asking. Henry asks, uh, is there a reason the mercury symbol is specifically is used for the workers in the diagrams? Um, so I have seen the mercury symbol used uh, to denote uh, androgyny, um, which is uh, in humans uh, being neither uh, looking fully female or male or like a woman or a man. Um, so I thought it was probably best to describe the worker cast in wasps because it's not really either female or male in their case either. Though, of course, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. Uh, human genders are nothing like wasp casts. Uh, Sarah asks, uh, is the potter wasp considered social? I thought I saw that nest image when you said they sting. Um, so the potter wasp is not a social wasp. There's actually uh, over 4,000 species of potter wasps in the world. <clears throat> Um, so they are not social, but they can sometimes uh, be communal, which means they nest in the same area, even though they don't directly um, cooperate to take care of each other's young. Um, so potter wasps are also super important wasps, and they're great for pest control, but they're not social species. Oscar asks, uh, I plan to go into entomology sometime in the future. Um, I've yet to start post-secondary school. Uh, is there anything you'd wish you'd known to begin with? Ah, oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, hmm. Again, I'm going to have to think on that one. Uh, uh, I think just having access to the specific terminology, um, so getting some resource that shows uh, the different anatomical uh, parts is super, super helpful when you're getting into entomology. Um, what else I'd wish I'd known? Uh, I think just how to network, which I know is kind of a cop out answer because it's true of all fields, but like networking in entomology is super, super important. Um, and just sending emails to other experts in your field and being like, hey, what are your thoughts on this? Um, because a lot of the time, uh, they will happily answer because they don't necessarily get very many emails from people. <laughs> um, so yeah, network as much as you can uh, is my advice. Uh, C asks, uh, do we know how many total wasp species that we have seen in New Jersey? Um, curious about some huge black ones I see on my swamp milkweed. Um, so I can actually tell you what those probably are. They're probably um, a species of Sphex, probably Sphex ichneumoides. Um, which is the, uh, I think they're called black cicada killers or something. Um, I've seen them out in our swamp, milk, swamp milkweed, so that's my best guess. Um, in New Jersey, there's at least probably at least 30,000 species, I want to say. Um, but the problem is like a lot of them are still undescribed because like there are not as many wasp scientists as there are wasps. Um, so a lot of them just aren't known to science yet, um, including just a lot of them that are just out there. Like we're no we know they're out there, but no one's got around to describing them as new species yet. <clears throat> um, so I'm not sure how many described species there are in New Jersey. Um, to get an estimate of that, I would go on iNaturalist and just type in wasps and New Jersey and just see what comes up because uh, that'll probably give you a better estimate than I'm able to give right now. Um, but again, that's the, num the number we know about and not the number that there are, um, especially because a lot of wasps are microscopic. The ones that don't sting, don't get frightened of that. Um, but <laughs> so it, there's a lot. <laughs> uh, Jenny asks, um, can one nest have multiple color morphs? Yes, and that's part of the reason we know they're the same species. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated than that because some species are inquilines, which means they will sneak into another wasp species nest and lay eggs, but we know that they're inquilines because they 
are always the same color pattern and are always like another queen in the nest <laughs> that shouldn't be there. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, if there's if there's a lot of different workers that all have different color morphs, we could be pretty sure that they're all the same species, um, which is one way that we can know. Um, so yes, yes, they can. Um, Anonymous uh, writes, do you have a favorite wasp? Um, my favorite wasp for today is moon wasps. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Uh, Marion asks, uh, do any of the wasps kill and destroy another wasp nest? Um, yes. Yes, they can. Um, typically, this doesn't happen very much um, with social wasps because um, they know there's excuse me, they know their strength in numbers. So sometimes they will intentionally nest next to another colony um, because that way there's even more protection because there's even more wasps uh, that can defend the nest. Um, but sometimes they do get territorial. Sometimes they do have territory war wars. Um, more often though, it'll be like um, a wasp nest versus an ant nest <laughs> instead of wasp versus wasp. Um, there's also uh, a couple of different kinds of hornet species um, that specifically target honeybees. Um, so they will go after honeybee colonies. Um, the Japanese giant hornet, which caused the murder hornet scare uh, in Washington state uh, a couple of years ago, that is one of the types of species that target honeybees, which is why a lot of apiarists were concerned about that. Um, it was still way blown out of proportion, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes wasps will kill other wasps uh, or target other wasp nests. Fairfax, Fairfax asks, hi Fairfax, I know her. Um, can you tell us about non-social wasps like digger wasps and cicada killers? Sure, that's a vague question. <laughs> so um, digger wasps and cicada killers were traditionally grouped within um, for Bronidae, which is a family. Um, I believe they are now grouped in Bembicidae. Um, and they are a bunch of different wasp species that dig uh, holes in sandy soil um, where they lay their eggs. Um, and then they will typically um, go out and find another uh, large insect and then sting it. Um, and then the venom makes the insects completely brain dead, but technically still alive. Um, and then they'll fly that insect back to their nest uh, and then close it up and then the the wasp uh, larvae will hatch out of the egg and then consume its host insect um, and then emerge as a uh, adult wasp the the next year. Um, so cicada killers are one of those uh, types of wasps. Um, side note, cicada killers pretend to be really big and dangerous and scary, but I've held one in my hand before. They, uh, their sting is just like a tiny pinprick. Like it doesn't hurt. Um, they they act a big game, but they're harmless. Um, so, fun fact. <laughs> uh, Bing Yang uh, asks, uh, "Thank you. That's so funny. Soup only. I do not understand what this means. Oh, it's in reference to the anatomy. Yes, the the pinch waist. Uh, it is funny. They." <laughs> I'm glad somebody said it. Um, I'm actually just gonna flip back to the to the end screen here. Uh while I can do, do, do. Whoop, there. Okay. Um Hannah asks, are honeybees the only ones that lose their stinger when they sting? Uh no. Uh, most uh bees within the family Apidae um do this. So all bumblebees will also uh lose their sting. Um and carpenter bees will as well. So the reason they do that is because there is a uh, a barb. Uh, on their stinger, so that way when they insert it, um, it gets ripped out <laughs> and they die soon afterwards, which is kind of a weird evolutionary path, I think, but um, it typically makes them more docile, so I guess that's good for us. <clears throat> um, Charlotte asks, uh, thank you for the wonderful lecture and answering all our questions. So. Well, you're very welcome. First of all, I love talking about wasps. Um, so are there more egg-laying wasps than a single queen in every hive if some more cast if some are more cast fluid? Um, it depends on the species. Um, in some species, it's just the queen that can lay worker eggs. In other species, um, 
the different females can vie for that position. Um, a lot of times they will like fight each other <laughs> if another wasp tries to lay eggs uh, in the nest. <clears throat> um, the other thing that's really weird about wasps is that um, I won't get into it in super detail um, because I will, and it will take like five, 10 minutes to explain, but like uh, wasp casts are often genetically determined. Um, the the queens and the workers have XX chromosomes and the males have just one X chromosome. Um, they're just haploid. Um, they have half of the DNA of uh, in that chromosome of the, the other wasps. Um, so, uh, Males are only born from unfertilized eggs, which means they're all clones of their mothers, even though they're in a completely different caste, which is crazy. Um, so the workers cannot be fertilized, so they can produce males, but they cannot produce workers or queens. And then the wasps can produce all three. <laughs> so it's, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot going on. Um, Eric mentions that Bug Guide is another online resource. I completely agree. Thank you, Eric, for mentioning that. Uh, Bugguide.net, bugguide.org. Just search Bug Guide online. It's a, it's a great resource for uh, discovering more about the insects in your area, if you live in the United States or Canada. Um, Jackie asks, are wasp species in decline similar to our native bees? Uh, can you please speak to any need for conservation practices and what they may be? Um, so yes, wasps are affected um, by the same uh, habitat loss and uh, pollutant concentrations, uh, land use change. Um, they are affected by climate change uh, and range drift and other extinctions. They, they are affected by all of the same factors that are putting stress on native bees. Um, and the good news is they need roughly the same conservation practices that bees do. Um, so anything that will uh, help bees um, will also help wasps. Um, now, in this context, I'm not talking about honeybees. Honeybees are an introduced species. They are not native to here, uh, and they are not really great for the environment. They're great for agriculture, but they don't really help out with any native pollination that much compared to what the native species do. <clears throat> um, so yeah, anything that will help native bees will also help native wasps. Uh, Andrea uh, says, uh, is there an easy reference for what you can plant to support native wasps in your area? Um, for example, I am in Maryland, and while there are things like iNaturalist, the state agricultural extension, um, uh, B-O-N-A-P, uh, this doesn't say what to plant for them. Um, yes, there's a fantastic book that recently came out, I am not being paid to say this, um, by uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Heather Holm. Um, she wrote a whole book about um, which different plants uh, have relationships with which different wasps. Now, it's not comprehensive. It only has, uh, I think, a uh, hundred or so species in it but it has one of the most of the more common ones um, and it can really give you a head start on diving into the ecological relationships between wasps and some of their host plants. Um, so that book is called uh, Wasps <laughs> by Heather Holm. Um, so yeah, should be easy to remember. Uh, Fen says, yeah, you such a fun presentation and engaging responses. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, Robin says, uh, are there specific wasp predators for cucumber beetles and squash bugs? And if so, how do you attract them? I don't know this. Um, I do not know the ecological relationships of every one of the 300,000 different species of wasps, but I know that there are some that target uh, cucumber beetles and squash bugs and other uh, beetles in the family Chrysomelidae. Um, my best bet is that they would be in the family Ichneumonidae, um, but I don't know that for certain. Um, there is uh, there is a book that just came out um, called Biodiversity and Classification of Wasps, um, which is a textbook, but it's free and online, and I helped write it. Um, I think if you like search Chrysomelidae, <laughs> Uh, in there, um, you might be able to find more information. Um, unfortunately, it's probably not studied <laughs> super well. Uh, so 
Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for you at this time. Um, Eric Eaton says, uh, Sphex pensylvanicus, uh, great black wasp, cicadated uh, hunter. So that's uh, an answer to the question of what is the big black wasp on the swamp milkweed. Thank you, Eric. Um, I appreciate you stepping in there um, very much. Um, Oscar says, what's the scientific name for the group that contains moon wasps? I looked up moon wasps and got nothing. Um, it is Apoica. So A-P-O-I-C-A. Uh, and then Dan says, in bees, the queen is diploid, but becomes a queen by royal jelly. How is it with wasps? It's similar. It's hormonal. Um, and it happens either in vitro uh, or by dominance uh, in the colony. It just triggers some uh, physical changes. It, it's weird. Um, but hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's all the questions. Well, I think that's a new record for question answering, too, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I need, I need a break. <laughs> <laughs> now, that was really fantastic. I learned so much more just listening to it. That's a great way to do it, like a short presentation. And who knew people would have that many <laughs> questions? But that was really fantastic. Thank you so much for being with us. I think you deserve a good rest right now. Maybe some. <laughs> thank you very this. much. <laughs> Yeah, and it's been my pleasure. And thank you all uh, for coming out to learn more about wasps tonight. This yeah, has been so fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And I hope to see you next month for our next program. Thanks again, Chris. Great. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>